Dr. Yankopoulos, who was scheduled to speak, had to withdraw, and we are honored and delighted that Dr. Jose Pazelga will be giving the next keynote lecture. He is the Physician-in-Chief at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. His longstanding research interests are in the development of targeted agents for the treatment of breast cancer and studying strategies to overcome mechanisms of resistance, with over 457 peer-reviewed publications to date. He has conducted pivotal laboratory and clinical studies that led to the approval of trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and everolimus, among other therapies. He is a past president of the American Association of Cancer Research, a past president of the European Society for Medical Oncology, and a past member of the Board of Directors of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society of Clinical Investigation, and the American Association, or the Association of American Physicians, and a fellow of the AACR Academy. He is also the founding editor-in-chief for the AACR flagship journal, Cancer Discovery. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baselga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for uh, this invitation. And uh, I wasn't here yesterday, so I don't know if this was announced, but if, uh, if not, I'll announce it again. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but I think we need to congratulate uh, a newly elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Parsons. So, congratulations. <laughs> And uh, to the point that Steve Workoff was making, I'll, I'll make some comments about pediatrics and because we are, uh, we are thinking about the same lines and it's a big issue, so I'll address that. So um, the vision of how to go forward, although it's not final and needs to be tweaked quite a lot, I think we begin to have some base understanding of what we can do with the kind of uh, resources that we have today and with the kind of knowledge that we have today. So basically, the power of sequencing tumors or sequencing blood by looking at cell-free DNA, and then having this data integrated into a database where we can then match specific therapies, either as a single agent or in combination, um, is basically uh, the proposition of what is known as precision cancer medicine, and that's what we're all trying to do uh, um, the best we can, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. But when people say, is this something that is going to work, uh, uh, at least in the field of leukemia, in the field of breast cancer, lung cancer, colon, and other tumor types, I, I think the answer is yes. And in breast cancer, uh, we have already targeted therapy, so the concept is far from new. We have the ER receptor, we have HER2, uh, as clear examples. And the case of HER2, I think, is paradigmatic because this is a disease that 20 years ago had an incredibly poor prognosis. It was clearly the worst uh, breast cancer that uh, anybody could be diagnosed with. And today, we have all these types of therapies that are quite remarkable in that they are improving the lives and they are saving many, many people. So um, in the metastatic a phase, just to give you a couple of vignettes of what we're talking about. Today, a combination of two antibodies, uh, pertuzumab and trastuzumab, they are against the HER2 receptor. They have non-overlapping mechanism of action. These two antibodies, they prolong survival in patients with stage 4 disease to almost five years. That's a way, a, a, a tremendous improvement. 20 years ago, the survival was nine months. And not only that, but in early disease, and uh, this is data that is very fresh. Um, in patients that have classically poor prognosis, such as uh, patients that are ER negative, as you see here on the left, or patients with lymph node positive, with appropriate therapy, they have um, disease-free recurrence rates at three years that are uh, in the range of 90%, to the point that we need to think very carefully how to treat these patients because it's not obvious that we will need to treat all of them with the best available therapy, they might not need it. So is this an exception? Uh, the answer is no. And this is a list of genes and particular alterations that uh, we um, recently published in which not only we have, um, not only these genes are, to the point that Joe was making, not, to, not only these, are, these genes are driver genes, that they've been qualified and they have an absolutely credential that driver genes, but we have therapies for each of one of these alterations that have, as of today, resulted in clinical benefit measured by a response in patients with advanced disease. So the number is not small, the number will go higher. Is this gonna be the solution to every single 
case, absolutely not. Uh, this is just about precision medicine. We need to talk about immunotherapies that I will not touch upon. So this is not going to be everybody, but it will be a significant percentage. And when people say, what is the percentage? Um, uh, why do we need to check tumors? Why do we need to sequence tumors? Uh, is that going to apply only to a small proportion of patients? The answer is no. It's not the case. Um, what you have here is the uh, display of different tumor types. And what you have here in the x-axis is the frequency uh, by which each of these tumors have druggable alterations. They might not be curative, but they are druggable alterations today. So it would be, I think, unthinkable today to treat a patient with other cancer without knowing the genomic uh, alterations present in that tumor. And it would be unthinkable uh, also in uh, other tumor types. Uh, and it will be hopefully soon uh, um, also required for I hope breast cancer. And when people say, uh, is this going to be reimbursed? It will be reimbursed as we provide value, as we provide evidence that this is helping in making decisions and in choosing therapies and in making estimates of outcome, uh, this will be reimbursed. Um, we don't know when, but it will be reimbursed. <laughs> in the meantime, we might be broke by the time it's been reimbursed, but that's another discussion. Uh, so let's go back then to this vision. And uh, what we have done uh, at our institution, like many others, is that we have developed a centralized effort at sequencing um, these tumors. And that's what we call um, MSK impact. So basically what happens is that every single patient with advanced disease that comes to our clinics, uh, we try to get them a consent. Uh, this is so important that we don't let our physicians do it. Uh, it's been done uh, by uh, our advanced practice providers and by our nurses. Um, we get the sample, uh, it's processed, and to us, I think the most important point, in addition to the whole sequencing effort, is to have in a clear certified system a database, and then from that database, we have um, a clinical report that comes out. So we have a team of curators, we have about uh, 40 curators, uh, uh, AKI uh, uh, lowly paid oncology fellows um, that they uh, report on the on <laughs> that's the way it is they report uh, that they report on the on the on the results um, and and then but also very importantly we also have a clinical trial matching system uh, in which uh, if a tumor has a particular alteration uh, that makes that tumor and that patient potentially eligible for a specific therapy, the result goes to the principal investigator, and the principal investigator then has the capacity to reach out to the physician and say, you know, if you don't mind, um, uh, would you consider this patient for this trial? And that has enabled us to enroll a lot of patients because as we've been talking in the prior uh, panel, uh, it is incredibly complex for physicians and for patients to understand uh, the meaning of these reports. Our list of genes is evolving. We have a committee that meets uh, uh, every six months and we decide which are the genes that we need to credential and place into the system. Uh, now we have gone beyond that and we also are beginning to look at fusion. So we are incorporating RNA-seq and we also are beginning to incorporate uh, uh, um, uh, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing in those cases that we think are important and that are silent um, with MSK impact. So this applies to pediatrics. So in pediatrics, we have decided that we're going to go with whole genome sequencing um, because this uh, focus panel would not be informative enough. However, uh, as it is, um, these are 500 genes, um, uh, and, and we cover a, a nice uh, target territory. And we favor scale over... Um, over um, territory because we want to make sure that we have thousands of patients that uh, can uh, be analyzed with this. So uh, we were able to just uh, publish the first data set um, uh, of, our, um, of, our, of our cohort. Uh, we have 62 tumor types. We have uh, principal tumor types. We have more than 300 detailed tumor types. And to a question that was being made before our metastasis, I'll show you something at the end of my talk. Uh, there is indeed actually um, uh, genes that are uh, evolving in metastasis, specifically 
upon therapeutic pressure. So I think selective therapeutic pressure is a big driver of the acquired mutations. So I think it is important, in fact, to not only look at the, um, at the host, uh, I agree with Nelly, but also we need to check for sure the tumor as well. So this is our ramp up. Uh, we have now close to 20,000, and the goal is have now 10,000 cases per year, and we're also implementing um, uh, self-free DNA assay. And the question that people are asking is, why do you need to look at so many genes? Why don't you just need to look at 30, 40 genes? And the answer to this is because 85% of all the hotspot mutations affect less than 5% of any cancer type. So this is the long tail of hotspot mutations across cancers. And if you have a panel of only 30 genes, you're gonna miss a lot of these, uh, well, a lot, 85% of the hotspot mutations. And this tail occurs at multiple levels. It occurs at the tumor type, it occurs at the uh, allele type, and also it, uh, um, it, it, it occurs uh, at the gene type. So we have gene variant and tumor level tails, and that's why we need to incorporate all this um, uh, large uh, gene panel. Now, the fact that we have, uh, however, this capacity to sequence all these genomes and to look at all these hot mutations is also apply in implying that we need to do clinical trials differently. We can no longer restrict the principle that one mutation, we go to the lab and then we have the animal model and we do all the validation and then we go to the clinic. We cannot possibly do that. So uh, what we are doing now, and I will not show you the example, but RB2 mutations is an example that I, I don't have today, but happy to discuss in the discussion. What we do is that we um, kind of pre-qualify the target based on recurrence, based on uh, pathology, on structure and expression and dosage of the drug that we want to study. And then we just enter every uh, mutation into, into the clinical trial and only those that we feel that there is a signal, these are the ones that then we go to the lab to um, have biological uh, validation. So the way that this looks like is by um, uh, designing clinical trials that are not based on a tumor location, but rather they are based on a specific uh, gen, uh, genomic alteration. These are the basket trials. Uh, this is not the only way to do it. Um, there is another approach uh, that people call it master, umbrella, or molecular allocation studies, and the NCI match, or the ASPI, or the battle uh, would be an example of that, uh, in which you have, at the same time, multiple drugs and multiple genes ready uh, to uh, offer to the patient. Um, we are focusing rather on the basket approach in which we uncouple in full the uh, sequencing to the clinical trial so that we can offer a particular therapy to the patient that we think is most likely to benefit. And, and, uh, but anyway, I think these are two approaches and they both have uh, uh, positives and, and, and limitations at the same time. And when it comes to basket trials, this is a list uh, of the current uh, basket trials that we have at our place. Uh, the number is not small, uh, as you can see. And the enrollment is also not small. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are now enrolling at our place more patients in phase one clinical trials than in phase two and than in phase three. And the clinical trials can be done in every clinic. We have decentralized the process. We used to have a place that was the phase one clinical trial unit. You don't need that. You can do clinical trials. We're doing phase one clinical trials in our original network. Uh, we open up a facility in Westchester, and we are going to be opening uh, phase one clinical trials uh, in Mammoth in New Jersey uh, very shortly. So you can decentralize the process, and the red limiting step here is to have the testing. So uh, this is when the testing came live in 2013, and look at the slope that we have of enrollment. This, this big, uh, large uh, uh, line um, is the uh, overall rate of enrollment into these basket studies. So the moment that you have testing, that uh, taking off of clinical trial enrollment occurs. And I'm gonna give you um, a few examples of that. Uh, the first one was the BRAF uh, basket study. So this is a basket study in patients with BRAF B600 mutations that did not have uh, melanoma because it's approved there. They did not have thyroid cancer, it's approved. So we chose all the other tumor types that have BRAF mutations. And what we found was quite dramatic uh, uh, examples of clinical activity 
for example, in lung cancer, and also very interesting in histiocytic disorders, uh, in particular in Adam Chester disease, which is a lymphoma type uh, uh, disorder that affects the brain, it affects the bone, the skin, and for which there is really no active therapy. So we began to treat these patients, and, and, and now, uh, three and a half years from the time that we began this, not a single patient. So 60% of these patients have BRAF uh, mutations, 60%. I think that tells us something about the, um, about the, um, the importance of that driver gene uh, by just its high frequency. So we began to treat patients, and three and a half years into this, not a single patient uh, has recurred. So they all are responding, they're all doing well. Um, and when we began to present this data, there was a story that was run in the New York Times by Gina Colada, and I think what's important is that the FDA is telling us that they are not gonna require randomized trials for these rare disorders in which you have clear clinical benefit with the targeted therapy. So in, the artic in this article, I think it's useful, uh, uh, Rich Parser, uh, who directs the FDA, the Office in Oncology, uh, mentioned, if a newer drug has a response rate of 50 or 60%, does it make sense to do a randomized trial? And even if a trial were planned, he said, would you go on that trial? Of course you would not go on that trial. Nobody would. And I think that's the basis for uh, that there is no need to, and actually it could be even unethical to do clinical trials randomized in this type of targets. So uh, there are several examples. Uh, AKT is a good example. Uh, rare mutation in breast cancer, it is present only in 2%. 4% in lobular, uh, but these AKT E17K mutations are clearly drivers. They are therapies that are available, so uh, we got uh, our uh, hands on a compound from AstraZeneca, and we began to see beautiful responses in a number of tumor types, in particular in ER positive breast cancer, and in particular in uh, a subgroup of breast cancer, which are the lobular uh, subtype. And the, 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 the images are quite uh, uh, dramatic, and they tell, they tell a story. So this is a patient with lobular breast cancer, the classical uh, infiltration of pleura and serosurfaces, such as um, uh, this periorbital infiltration that went away uh, just with this um, single agent uh, uh, disease. Uh, therapy, I'm sorry. And then to the point of cell free DNA, uh, we are now incorporating cell free DNA analysis into all these targeted therapies. So in this case, it is an RT PCR based um, assay uh, looking at the AKT E17K mutation. By day eight, we know, day eight because it's the first time we look, uh, we know that the tumor is responding <coughs> because uh, we uh, have the drop uh, in the. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the mutant clone in, in cell-free DNA. So it's quite useful, and it precedes CAT scan. And not only it precedes response, but it's also it's telling us, before anything else, that the patient or the tumor will stop responding. And in this particular case, uh, what we uh, observed in this trial that we just published in JCO is that we have a 42-day lead uh, before any imaging study, whether the tumor is progressing or not. And we had one case that was quite interesting. The patient had a huge response on the AKT clone, and we began to see an ESR1 clone that was coming up, and, and, and that clearly was a marker of resistance. So we um, were able to introduce fulvestrin. The clone went down, and the patient was on uh, the protocol for uh, over 300 days. So I think that this self DNA may enable us to tweak the issue of the combination therapy because we are gonna be seeing clonal evolution or if you wish, the war of clones that will take place and we can uh, interfere. So talking about pediatrics, um, we decided that we are, it's not a cost issue. It is not a cost issue, I, I disagree in full. It's a philosophical issue and it's a matter of principle. And the matter of principle is that we need to do it. And the matter of principle is that we need to find a way with drug companies that they um, work with us because they are not gonna have single uh, indications in pediatrics, they, they're not gonna do that. So what we are doing with them is two things. One is we're asking them to decrease the age limit in the adult protocols. So many of these adult protocols have uh, eligibility criteria that has to be 18 or older. This does not apply here. I mean, there's no reason for that. These are safe drugs. So they're quite eager to do that. 
or if you find particular mutations, what they let you do is they let you do an N of one clinical trial. Um, and that's what we do. So just N of one. And one plus one plus one plus one, hopefully we'll be able to increase the number of patients that we offer. And this is a great example. So this is an eight year old girl that um, had a secretory breast carcinoma, a very rare form of breast cancer. This is a girl from Bangladesh of all places. And there was a program uh, that was led by Hopkins and MGH, a foundation that somehow provides support to um, children with cancer, and, 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 and she benefited from that. And, and they sent the tumor to us for sequencing. So this girl, um, over the following six years, uh, had received multiple chemotherapies, um, had not responded to any, multiple surgeries, and always had recurred. And then when we got the sample, uh, we found that uh, the uh, patient had uh, 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 a characteristic mutation um, for uh, this um, disorder, uh, uh, this uh, fusion gene, NTREC. I, I was not aware of this fusion gene in this disease. Uh, Nelly was, we were in a meeting together, and she just raised her hand and said, I knew that this was this uh, characteristic. But these NTREC fusion genes are, are, are quite frequent. And look at the situation with this little girl, uh, how uh, she responded. Uh, so uh, it, it's working, and it's working in children, and it's something that uh, this is going to be published um, by Neil Shukla uh, shortly. So it can be done, and we need to do a better job, but I think this is critically important. I don't have much time. I'm going to go, how much time do I have? Five minutes. So let me go to final story that I want to cover, and uh, I'll, this is, these are PIC kinase inhibitors, bottom line. Uh, PIC kinase mutations are very frequent in breast cancer. We're very excited, and, and we're doing clinical trials. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I like to focus on, on this part, if I may, which is, the last, which is the last part. And this is the concept on how to study tumor evolution, and, and, and I think tumor evolution is important in cancer for a number of reasons. First of all, because genome instability leads to new genetic aberrations. And, and, and it enables them, these daughter cells, to adapt to new environments. So this is fast and furious uh, genomic evolution just because of the uh, genomic instability that is inherent with the disease. Cancer evolution, and somebody said the opposite, I disagree, is not always stochastic. It is many times, but it's not always. And there are recurring commonalities that suggest that there are rules and constraints that dictate how a tumor can evolve. And if that's the case, we can possibly identify a rule book of cancer evolution that should help us design improved therapies. So to this point, uh, this is a study that we did in collaboration with Elaine Mardis. Uh, I don't know if you covered this yesterday or if you did not. So, um, so this is a pa patient that had responded to a PSC kinase alpha inhibitor. The patient progressed, unfortunately, after 10 months of response, the patient died. We were able to obtain uh, research at Topsy, and we were able to sequence the multiple uh, tumor types, the multiple tumor sites. And what we found in the sites that were progressing in lung metastasis is that the patient had a P10 loss. Uh, uh, so one copy loss and one P10 mutation. And this was not present in the primary tumor. This was not present in the site that was still responding to therapy. So then we sequenced every single site that we could analyze. And what we found is that in the majority of the non-responding sites, we had different p mutations that led to a conversion phenotype. So this is what in HIV they have studied so well. This is a classical story of parallel evolution uh, that leads to a conversion phenotype that in this case uh, is responsible for uh, resistance to PI3 kinase alpha. So we were able to grow a chenograph, a PDX, from that patient into our, uh, um, in, 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 in our mouse system. And when we treated the tumor with a PI3 kinase beta uh, inhibitor, we were able to reverse sensitivity. So that was just an initial study. And then we said, let's go forward now. And we have launched an effort uh, to study metastatic, um, uh, uh, the metastatic landscape in breast cancer. And we have now close to 2,000 tumors. Our data set is very different from the one of TCGA because um, the, the majority of our patients have metastatic disease and also they have received prior therapy. And now we begin to see genes that are mutant preferentially in the metastatic setting as opposed to the primary setting. So which is the poster child for this? ERCR1. 
but also you have RE2, FGFR, NF1 deletions, uh, P53, P53 again. This is by the different subtypes. So this is telling us, right? And then uh, we are in a process in which we are looking at the different therapies. So we took all our patients that had been exposed to hormonal therapy, and then we are beginning to sequence these tumors, and we asked the question, what mutations are appearing in this population of patients that have been exposed and progressed to hormone therapy? So the first one is the ER1 mutations that published, uh, uh, our group and others uh, published this finding, and that's that's good, that's a good confirmatory, um, a good confirmatory data set, 20% of patients. But now we are beginning to see something that is really interesting. So we have one group, which are the ER mutants, that's 20%, that's one. Then we have another group of genes that had not been previously described, which are genes that upon their alteration, they'll activate the MAP kinase pathway. So which are these genes? Loss of NF1. RB2 mutations, EGFR amplification, all these activates the MAP kinase, and they're present, and they're mutually exclusive. So we can, we can work on that. You know, we have EGFR antibodies, we have MAP kinase inhibitors, so this is something that we could work. And then finally, there's another group of transcriptional regulation, and I did not touch upon that, but we are working very heavily on transcriptional uh, factors, and we have been able to identify mechanisms that are epigenetically regulating ER transcription. And then, of course, our good old friend, Mick, shows up at the party as well, um, and, and that is also to be expected. So, there's an evolving taxonomy, if you wish, of ER-resistant breast cancer. ER-1, PMAP kinase pathway, and transcriptional. And this is information that is important because if a tumor has an ES1 mutation, it will not respond to an aromatase inhibitor. So if you ask me, is this information that you would like to have in the clinic? The answer is absolutely yes. I want it yesterday. And, and it is something that um, we need to make the case. One last uh, piece of data, uh, uh, and this is a sobering piece of data uh, before I finish. Uh, we have been able to study, in many cases, by whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, tumor evolution because we have different sample sites. And what we see is that clearly uh, evolution occurs. There are, meta there are genomic alterations in KRAS, in FF1, uh, et cetera, that appear in the metastatic site, not in the primary. But the sobering case is the case here. This is the case um, that we were able to obtain an autopsy. This patient was diagnosed, and we had an initial biopsy at the time of diagnosis with early breast cancer, P53 mutation, FGFR1 amplification. At one point, and then uh, at one, we were able to do an autopsy when she died. At one point in the process, this tumor underwent genomic doubling, and then. She had multiple metastatic sites. So here, uh, CM1 um, uh, is a cutaneous metastasis. We have lymph node, we have chest wall, etc. And what you'll see is that in every site, you have different mutations that, it's again a story of parallel evolution, different mutations that lead to the same convergent phenotype. So this is RB2, this is PI3 kinase, etc. So multiple clones. Now, if you were to biopsy this site, you would miss this mutation. Uh, so I think the power of cell-free DNA is one that will enable us to study everything. So, and also the point here, the corollary here, is that we need to treat early because when this is so advanced, it's gonna be incredibly difficult to be able to address all the mutations that evolve in parallel in the different tumor types. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish uh, here. Um, just one additional piece of data, and that's the issue of the power of cell-free DNA. So this is a real, uh, this is a real case. Um, if you just uh, sequence uh, um, uh, the, the primary, the metastasis, uh, you will f miss things that you will detect in the liquid biopsy. So I think this is going to be a tremendous tool going forward, and we have launched a huge effort now to develop cell-free DNA in a clear certified lab. So um, I'm gonna finish. Um, uh, this is a work uh, by tremendous amount of people. I'd like to acknowledge 
um, the Center for Molecular Oncology. This is David Solly, this is Mike Berger, this is uh, Barry Taylor, our early drug development group led by David Hyman, and then our uh, amazing uh, breast team that have been working so hard in making this possible. And then finally, my lab. Thank you very much.